Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, and I'll get started with a big uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors with MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and tonight we start a whole new sutra, a whole new series, a whole new year. It's just new, new, newness all around. Um, and so, uh, first of all, I hope everybody is doing well. I hope everybody is dry. <laughs> I hope everybody is safe, happy, all of that. And uh, let's go ahead and jump in. So for this new year, I have a new kind of plan, sort of. Uh, so first of all, we will start a new sutra tonight. But before I even talk about the sutra, I want to tell you sort of about the theme for, well, at least for the next several Dharma doors. I don't know exactly how long this will go on, but the theme for sort of this winter is Upaya. So these are going to be Knights of Upaya or the Upaya Knights, as I was calling it. Um, so that idea of Upaya, of course, is this idea of skillful means. And in many ways, this is a continuation of last year's study of the Bodhisattva path. So we spent a year studying a sutra that was all about the Bodhisattva path. And we basically, or I, I dedicated each Sunday night to a different um, aspect of the Bodhisattva path, um, just a different idea. And they were all ideas that were coming out of the sutra that we were studying. Coming out of that, what I wanted to dedicate this series to is sort of about putting all of that into practice. So that's where upaya comes in, this idea of skillfulness. And so in a way, having learned everything that we learned last year, we want to kind of, or I would like to explore now, ways of putting all of that into practice. So that is to say that starting with tonight, I would like to make the Dharma doors here a little bit more conversational about practice. Um, I know I have a tendency to go off so I'm going to try to reel that in a little bit. Um, so in other words, I do want to kind of make this more ab about our collective practice in that way. So there's that. So we're going to be looking at things having to do with being a bodhisattva, the main topic of which is this idea of upaya, skillful means. And in order to do that, we're going to look at a sutra. It, it wouldn't be the Dharma doors if we weren't looking at a sutra. And so the sutra that we're going to be doing is this one called the Upaya Kaushalya Sutra, the Skill in Means Sutra. I'll talk more about that text uh, maybe right now. Um, yeah, actually, no, I'm gonna hold off on the text for a second. I want to get kind of more, a little more context in that way. So regarding this idea of upaya or skillfulness, a couple of things come up. And in many ways, I, I do need the sutra, but only to start. So I mentioned that this is the title in Sanskrit, this Upaya Kaushalya. And what's interesting about that longer word, Upaya Kaushalya, is that that actually means skillful or expedient Upaya. So in other words, Whenever we have been, and I'm, I'm the main culprit here, whenever we have been translating this term upaya as skillful means or expedient means, 
The word upaya actually just means means, <laughs> a, a, a way of doing something. And that upaya, it could be skillful or not, in other words. Upaya is just a means of doing something, but you could be, you could take the long way around and it wouldn't be expedient. It wouldn't be skillful, but it would still be upaya in that sense. Now, upaya kashalya is kind of a mouthful, especially if you don't speak Sanskrit. And so it's been shortened to just upaya. And the presumption or the assumption is that we are talking about skillful upaya. But I mention this be, just because in terms of keeping the Dharma doors about practice, we're going to be thinking about skillful practice, expedient practice. And the sutra that I want to kind of share with you is a collection of teachings of the Buddha. It's also a collection of stories and tales that are all about skillful practice. But what that means is this. So if you hadn't come to last year's series, or if by any chance you don't remember or whatever, I want to remind you kind of the general idea of upaya, just a general idea. And a general idea of upaya or skillful means, it, it sort of is about, well, as I often like to say, it's about, mm, it's about really being present. And what I mean by that is, is upaya is about responding skillfully to a situation. And part of what that means is, is that it, it might be a situation that we weren't ready for. And so skillfulness or expediency in that sense is about responding appropriately in the moment in that way. So there's a lot of aspects to upaya. And what we're going to do in the next kind of uh, coming weeks is explore all the different aspects of this kind of essential teaching. Now, I will start off by reminding everybody that upaya is very much a Mahayana Buddhist idea. Oh, you'll find upaya in the Pali Canon. You will find skillful or kushala upaya that you will find that idea but it usually just refers to the skillfulness of the buddha that if the if the buddha gave a a, a good analogy a good simile or a metaphor then that was considered the buddha's upaya that the Buddha was very skillful in teaching the Dharma. And so Upaya was sort of solely within the domain of a Buddha. And within the early school of Buddhism, Upaya was exclusively in the realm of the historical Buddha. But in the Mahayana tradition, which by the way, and I don't even know if I mentioned this all of last year, which is surprising if I didn't, but there's another name for Mahayana Buddhism. That other name, or it's kind of like an older name for Mahayana Buddhism or an alternate name, it's called the Bodhisattva Yana. Now, you know this word Yana, a Yana means a vehicle, and they usually talk about little vehicle, great vehicle, Hinayana, Mahayana. But the Maha, the great yana, the great vehicle, was also known as the Bodhisattva yana, the Bodhisattva vehicle. And in the Bodhisattva path, vehicle, way to enlightenment, the Bodhisattva practices upaya. In, in, indeed, it actually becomes a sev the seventh 
paramita, the seventh perfection or the seventh practice of a bodhisattva. And that's something entirely kind of new to the Mahayana or the Bodhisattva Yana, which is a practitioner, a, 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 a Bodhisattva doing this uh, Buddha-like thing, this Buddha-like thing, meaning being expedient. And so we're going to be kind of looking at Upaya, of course, very much within that context and not the earlier uh, poly context in that way. So let's go ahead and dive into a little bit of upaya. And by that, I mean, I want to tell you a little bit more about the sutra that we're going to be looking at. So unfortunately, there's not a lot of English translations of this sutra. And even more unfortunately, I couldn't find any that were available online. So there are only two English translations of this sutra. One is this one by Mark Tatz. And there is the good old <laughs> Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, our classic collection from, of the Ratnakuta collection. And it is the 22nd, the last sutra in this collection. It's not by the way, the last sutra of the Ratnakuta collection, it's actually number 38 of the 49 sutras in the Maharatnakuta, um, but they put it last in this collection, and they call it on the paramita of ingenuity. Ingenuity is a uh, great, <laughs> very interesting translation of upaya, ingenuity. Okay. So these are our two English translations. This one's from Tibetan, and there are two existing Tibetan versions. And this is actually an interesting translation. Let me see if I can show you this. So this guy... Mark Tatz, and I want to tell you a little, or I want to talk about Mark uh, Mark Tatz in a second. But what this version does here, I'll give you an example here. So if if you're really into sutras, this is a great addition. So you'll see here that he has his translation, and then all of a sudden you get two columns. And what he's done is he's actually translated both Tibetan versions. And whenever there's like discrepancies or differences between the two, he splits it so you can compare and contrast. So it's a very interesting translation, very, very scholarly, very scholastic. Um, it's a really helpful reference because as you know, or as you probably know, Translations from the Tibetan, Tibetan is much closer to Sanskrit. And so when we have translations from the Sanskrit, or sorry, when we have translations from Tibetan, we can get a, a clearer glimpse into the original version. So we're going to be kind of relying on this a little bit. This version, of course, is from the Chinese, and there's three Chinese versions of this sutra, a, a really old one. I think it's like even from the 300s, maybe even the 200s, like the late 200s AD. Then there's a slightly uh, later one, I think from maybe the Tang dynasty, early Tang, that's this version. And then there's a, a later version that's pretty similar to this one. And this, uh, the one that's translated here, is the one from the Maharatna Kuta collection, which reminds me, I should mention, this is another one of those sutras that even though it's in that Maharatna Kuta collection, it's one of those sutras that has a life all on its own, meaning it was a sutra just out in the world that at some point got included in the Maharatna Kuta collection. So this is a pretty popular sutra, and 
I choose that word popular for a reason. This sutra is very, um, um, well, how can I put it? It's for a very general audience. Like I said a moment ago, it's full of stories and tales and all kinds of things. And so it's one of those sutras that's kind of, it's kind of perfect for the Dharma doors because it's for such a broad general audience in that way. So I'm excited to read it, all of that. Before we get into it though, just as a little uh, sidestep, I was trying to find information about Mark Tatz, Professor, Dr. Mark Tetz, who was, I don't believe he is any longer, but he was at Berkeley, at the uh, Buddhist Studies Institute in Berkeley. And in the late 90s, he published this book, along with a bunch of um, pretty celebrated essays or articles, journal entries, and he also published an interesting book that I want to share with you. And this is actually related to Upaya. So he also, um, I guess it's not quite a translation, but I'll tell you about it. So there's this book, but it's not actually a book. It's a game. And so it is the Tibetan game of liberation. So the book, because it is a published book, is called Rebirth by Mark Tatz and Jody Kent. And what this is, is if you if you find a copy, make sure it has this. <laughs> so this is, oh, and Mark Tatz, by the way, is a Tibetologist. So he is a Tibet specialist. Uh, translates Tibetan. And this is, let's see here. So it looks like a tanka, if, if you know about the, that Tibetan art form. But if you open it up, it is a board, a game board. And you would use dice, and you would use little uh, pieces. So you'd lay this out. And according to this book, <laughs> I, you know, I would, I would want to do a little more research, but it would seem that the American, and I believe it's also European, but the American slash European game shoots and ladders if you've ever played shoots and ladders as a child, they claim that it comes from this Tibetan mon monastery game. And it's a re I, I haven't ever played it because I have found I haven't found anybody geeky enough to play this with me, but it's like shoots and ladders where you're trying to move up and get basically enlightened. But along the way, if you roll the wrong dice, you will go uh, shooting back down <laughs> or sliding back down the ladder. And you can even wind up in hell realms or and hell realms for different periods of time. You can get up to heavenly realms. They have the four dhyanas. So it's an amazing uh, way to learn the Dharma. And in fact, that's what kind of this, the book, the book portion of this is about how it was used in Tibetan monasteries to teach monastic children the basics of the Dharma. It also teaches you the cosmology. So if you don't know your Buddhist cosmology with all the different heavenly realms and all of that, this is a great resource to learn about them. But I mention this, of course, because this is a great example of upaya. This is a tremendous upaya or expedient in that way, especially when we're talking about teaching the chil uh, teaching dharma to children. An area in which you have to be especially skillful in that way. So I thought it was interesting that Mark Tatz worked on both this most upayak work as well as the 
Upaya Sutra. So that's a little bit on Mark Tatz. Like I said, I haven't been able to find much more about this person. I don't even know if they're still alive because they, um, they're, I managed, you know, the internet is a wild place, right? So I managed to get a PDF of this person's um, CV, their curriculum vitae, and it's like handwritten on a piece of paper. Of, so he, it must have been from back in the days when you could hand in such a, um, a CV. Uh, so he seems to be from back in like the 80s and then was publishing in the 90s. And so, again, I don't know if he's still around. He's not at the Buddhist Studies Institute anymore in Berkeley. So if anybody knows, I'd love to hear if he's still around. Otherwise, let's... Otherwise, that'll, again, we're going to refer to uh, Mark Tatz's work as a reference, but as usual, I'm going to be sticking to the, um, the Chinese version. So let's go ahead and get into it. So each of these Sunday nights moving forward, the overarching the theme is upaya. But then each Sunday night, we're going to kind of have a specific topic. And tonight, the specific topic that I want to talk about is skillful giving. There, in many ways, giving, dana, generosity, is upaya. <laughs> it's not that, like, it's a form of upaya. It is upaya in that way. So it's a great place to start is to look at skillful giving. And I think, let's see. Um, yeah, let me, I'm going to start slowly working into the sutra. And the normal way that we do that, of course, is that we talk about the title. <laughs> this is one of those sutras that has, oh, yeah, no. I didn't know if there'd be any questions so soon. Yeah. Can you hear me? I just wanted to uh, double check if I understood right. The Mark Tatz version is translated from the Tibetan. The Ratnakuta is translated from the second of three Chinese versions. And you're also working from your own translation. Ah. And, and which version of the Chinese is that? So, so I, yep. Yeah. I am working on my own translation, but it's slow going, so I don't have anything really to share just yet. But the version I am working on is the same as this one. That's, again, that one is kind of considered the standard edition, where the earlier one is a little archaic, and the later one is basically just the same one, so. Okay, so the sutra has a couple of different titles. I mentioned it's it's called the upaya kashalya, and that word kashalya is related to kushala, and you might know the phrase kushala dharma and akushala dharma. Usually translated as wholesome dharmas, wholesome things, or good dharmas, kushala dharma, and then not good, unwholesome, akushala dharma. So upaya kashalya is related to that idea of beneficial or good upaya. So that's one of the titles. There's another title, I believe it's the Tibetan title or one of the Tibetan versions, the title is the Nyanotada sutra and that's because the main bodhisattva who asks the buddha all the questions about upaya is named nyana knowledge utara tara of course means above top so nyanotara is like high nyana very like the top top knowledge <laughs> Bodhisattva. It's also 
seemingly in the original Sanskrit that we don't have, we just have the Tibetan, it was called the Nyanotara Paripricha Sutra, the questions of Nyanotara. And then I have even seen, and it might be that this is the official title of the second later Tibetan translation, but I have even seen it as the Upaya Kashalya Nyanotara Paripricha Sutra. <laughs> so they all of those together. <laughs> so, all right. And you, you all know this about sutra studies. Whenever you study sutras, you have to talk about the title. You have to talk about its meaning. And then we can talk about the sutra. So everybody doing okay? So I'm going to just get to the part that I want to talk about, about skillful giving. So let me dive in and let me just show you or, or um, read to you how this starts. Thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was dwelling near Shravasti in the garden of Anathapindika in the Jetta Grove, accompanied by eight thousand monks, all of whom were great shravakas in the learning stage or in the stage beyond learning, and by 12,000 bodhisattva mahasattvas known to all, who had achieved miraculous superpowers, dharani memory power, unhindered eloquence, the realization of all dharmas, and countless merit. At that time, the Tathagata emerged from Samadhi concentration and was ready to teach the Dharma to the incalculable hundreds of thousands of millions of billions of sentient beings who surrounded respectfully. Then, in the assembly, a Bodhisattva Mahasattva named Nyanotada, superior wisdom, rose from his seat, bared his right shoulder, knelt with his right knee on the ground, joined his palms toward the Buddha, and reverentially said, World honored one, I wish to ask a question. May you be so kind as allow me to do so. I dare not bring up my question without the permission of the Buddha. The Buddha told Nyanotara Bodhisattva, Noble one, you may inquire as you like. I will answer you and resolve all your doubts. Then Bodhisattva Nyanotara asked the Buddha, World Honored One, regarding Upaya, what is the Upaya of a Bodhisattva? World Honored One, how does a bodhisattva practice upaya? After Bodhisattva Nyanotara had asked his question, the Buddha praised him saying, excellent, excellent, that for the sake of all the Bodhisattva Mahasattvas, you ask about the meaning of upaya. This will benefit comfort and gladden many sentient beings. Kulaputra noble child, in order to show compassion for both gods and humans, to bring them peace, happiness, and benefit, and to help them obtain the wisdom of the future bodhisattvas and buddhas of the past, present, and future. I will now explain, th explain this to you. Listen carefully and think well about it. Bodhisattva Nyanotara obeyed and listened. The Buddha said, Kulaputra, noble child, a bodhisattva who practices upaya can use even a handful of food as alms for all sentient beings. How so? When a bodhisattva who practices upaya gives a handful of food to any sentient being, even an animal, they do so with the aspiration for all-knowing wisdom and vows to share 
the merit of this giving with all sentient beings by transferring it to Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, Supreme Unsurpassable Enlightenment. Because of those two things, seeking all-knowing wisdom and skillfully vowing to transfer, the Bodhisattva attracts sentient beings into their following. Kulaputra, noble child. This is the upaya practiced by a bodhisattva. Okay, so we're going to start there. And that's our introduction to the theme tonight, this idea of skillful giving. So the first thing I want to start off with, and I'm, you know, I chose this sutra because it starts off that way. I want to start off by reminding everybody of something very, very important. It's a very important thing that I, I mention all the time, but I'm, I'm going to start this series by mentioning it again. So it has to do with this bodhisattva practice of dana, generosity or giving. So if you were here, of course, last year, or you know your dharma, you know that dana is the first paramita. It's like the first thing a bodhisattva works on or practices is generosity or giving. And that's echoed in our sutra here. The thing about it is, though, is there's something very important to remember, which is that in the Hinayana, in the, in the earlier form of Buddhism, there's a very different dynamic around give, giving. And what I mean is, in the early form of Buddhism, Buddhist practitioners, by which I mean bhikshus and bhikshunis, monks and nuns, in the early form of Buddhism, which was a renunciatory monastic path for bhikshus and bhikshunis, in that form of Buddhism, monastics, bhikshus, they didn't practice giving. They actually practiced receiving. And what I mean by that is, is that the practice of a, of a bhikshu, in fact, it's what bhikshu means. Bhikshu means a beggar. That's like what bhikshu means, to beg. And so the early form of Buddhism was about going around and begging for your daily food. In fact, in the early form of Buddhism, that's what constituted right livelihood. How do you survive every day? By begging. That's the right way to survive. Farming, a job, uh, uh, stock dividends, that was not considered right livelihood. What was considered right livelihood was begging. And so what that did is that in the Hinayana, the early form of Buddhism, it made the practice a practice of humility, a practice of, uh, well, actually, if you get really into it, there are so many aspects to to begging for, for um, asking for donations or asking for alms, as it would be called. There's so many aspects to that. And I don't, I do not want to sound derogatory to that practice. It's, it's, it's worthy of reverence, I have to tell you. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm putting it down, but it's just kind of the reality of the practice that the early form of Buddhism, to be a Buddhist meant that you were a receiver. You received gifts. And in the Theravada tradition, which is the version of the Hinayana that survives today, that is still the practice to beg or at least be in a position of receiving and in, at least in Southeast Asia, 
where Buddhist monasticism, like the old school form of monasticism, where that's still practiced, the monastics, you know, they go out into public and they do like a, uh, a pro, um, like a procession, I guess you would call it, where people line up with offerings, with food or clothing or what have you, even, even money these days. And then the monks, it like avail themselves. And the idea is, is that you are getting the opportunity to give a monastic something. And so there's an opportunity to get merit, to get like punya for lay people but I want to say it again, but the practice of the monastics were to be on the receiving end. So right away, the bodhisattva path is different because the bodhisattva is in the business of giving, not receiving in that way. But a bodhisattva, as I tried to make abundantly clear last year, a bodhisattva or the bodhisattva yana, the bodhisattva vehicle, is not a lay, is not a lay form of Buddhism. So it's not that the bodhisattvas are the givers and the monastics are the receivers. No, in the early form of Buddhism, to be a Buddhist meant you were a beggar receiver. And that shifts in the Mahayana. And there, I, I'll, I want to get deeper into it in a second, but I want to kind of mention that there's this uh, idea, um, it's a concept, it's a term that was coined by uh, the late Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, and the phrase is, is this idea of socially engaged Buddhism. The thing about it is, and Thich Nhat Hanh would, would tell you this as well, socially engaged Buddhism is the Bodhisattva Yana. Socially engaged Buddhism is Mahayana Buddhism versus the monastic form of Buddhism where the monks are off in the monastery doing their meditation, working on themselves, purifying themselves, and as they purify themselves, they go out into public and avail themselves for people to give them things. Whereas in the bodhisattva yana, in the bodhisattva vehicle, it's the practice of the bodhisattva to go out. And I wouldn't even say to go out, actually, but it is the practice of the bodhisattva to be a generous giver. And so now, Let's check this out again. When a bodhisattva who practices upaya, if they give a if they give a handful of food to any sentient being, even an animal, they do so with the aspiration for all knowing wisdom and vow to share the merit of that giving with all sentient beings. So there's more, more to it that I want to dive into, but that idea right there, that it is, <laughs> it is a superior practice of wisdom and upaya to give food to an animal. That is not what was going on in the early form of Buddhism. In the Mahayana though, that's why Mahayana Buddhism is this very kind of, um, you know, unique form of Buddhism, even though it is kind of in terms of the world of Buddhism, it's the dominant form of Buddhism. But it, I just wanna make this distinction between the monastic form and then this kind of form where the practice is to be generous in giving, even to animals in that way. So 
let's now start to kind of dissect the upaya of this. So the idea is, is, well, the idea around giving generosity. So let's sort of put it this way. I like to teach the paramitas. So there's these six paramitas, right? The six practices of the bodhisattva, generosity or giving, moral discipline or shila, kashanti, patience, virya, drive or determination, dhyana, meditation, and pranya, wisdom. So those are the six practices of the bodhisattva. The way that I like to teach these, though, is that the practice of giving of the bodhisattva, I would suggest that it is a demonstration of wisdom, not a kind of, um, how could I put it? Like, I know that culturally, being generous is considered like a, a, a noble virtue in that way. And so in the early form of Buddhism, it was considered kind of meritorious, virtuous to, to give. And the idea is, is that it is, it is virtuous, it is that. But the Bodhisattva is coming at it from a different place. And what that place is, and again, this is just sort of the way that I would upayakly teach the, the practice of giving. It's sort of about looking at it this way. You kind of have two options. One option is to, you know, keep it. <laughs> I'm not going to go so far as to say hoarding. You know, hoarding is a very particular, you know, version of holding on, right? But the basic idea is, like, you know, let's say I'm walking down the street, and let's say somebody's on the street, and they ask me for some money, and let's say, let's say they ask me for a dollar. Let's say I have a dollar. I got two options, keep my dollar or give my dollar, right? Well, the idea is, is that while it is virtuous and meritorious to give rather than hold on to it, from the Bodhisattva's point of view, though, they're looking at this a little more deeply. And what they're looking at is the psychological machinations of holding on. And what I mean by that is, if you know your Dharma, and now I'm talking about all of the teachings of the Buddha, so the early teachings, Mahayana, if you know your Dharma, you know that a big part of it, if not the central part of it, is this teaching about well, what they call no self, but teaching about the nature of the self. In particular, it's the teaching about deluded, confused, ignorant ideas that we have about ourselves. And those ignorant, confused, deluded ideas about the self are, it's complex to say the least. There's a lot going on with that sense of self. And tonight's Dharma talk is not about the no self anatta or anatman idea. So I'm just going to bank. I'm going to hope that you already know that general teaching. And I'm going to hope that you're already aware of some of the pitfalls and dangers of that 
deluded, confused sense of self. All right. So I got to I got to rely on this idea that you are already somewhat convinced of that idea. And I say that because if we understand that there's like a confused, deluded sense of self. Actually, let me be upayak for, for a change. And I'll get, give you a, um, an example of what I'm kind of getting at regarding this idea of confused, deluded senses of self. So here's an example. So this idea that I have of Michael, which is to say myself, right? That's the idea of myself. And I have ideas of myself, of course, like you do about yourself. And one of the ideas that I might have about myself, and this is sort of this like, um, like how can we, how can I put this? It's about like, so I might have this idea of myself as, and actually I don't want to put it, I'm sorry if I'm stumbling, I'm trying to find the right way to phrase this because it, it's tricky. But what I'm thinking about is, let's say that I have this desire or this sense that I want, and again, I don't mean it that way. It's not about what I want. It's just sort of an idea that the people might, or I would like people to think of me as a capable, intelligent person. That's Michael, to me, right? That idea, a capable, intelligent person, right? Then it might so happen that I, and it happens all the time, that I might say the wrong date or, you know, just say, give, give wrong information. And then somebody might correct me and say, hey, that's not right, what you said. That's like wrong information. If that were to happen and it has happened, my deluded sense of self is injured and that could send me, Michael, into, a, you know, I'm not going to say a state of depression, but I mean that I would be feeling anxiety and stress about that. And why? because there's somebody out there that, that doesn't think I'm capable and intelligent. When I'm trying to preserve, I'm trying to hold on to this sense of self that's capable and intelligent. And this situation is damaging what I'm trying to hold up there. And of course, the Dharma, the noble truth of that is that my desire to hold on to that sense of self is again, threatened and then here comes the dukkha, here comes the stress and the anxiety. But it's only coming from my own doing. It's only coming from my own desire to have this. No, I'm this person. You've got it wrong. That's the deluded sense of self. This imagined idea of self. When really, I'm out here giving right information, wrong information, sideways information, just all kinds of information. So I hope that came across. I was trying to find the right way, but it's about that ego, that sense of self that we are all trying to sort of defend, preserve, and prop up. So now that we have a sense of that, that deluded sense of self, what the Bodhisattva understands about these two directions, the two directions of either holding on or being generous. What the Bodhisattva understands is that the holding on version is very supportive of that deluded sense of self. And you know, you could, I could go back to my example of 
I'm walking down the street and somebody asks me for a dollar. And then I either hold on to it or generously give it away. And the Bodhisattva looks at those two options and sees what this one, the holding on, the Bodhisattva sees how that perpetuates a lot of different things, a lot of different things, even if it's just a dollar, right? Now, you, we all have our reasons why we would, in that situation, if we had a dollar and were asked for it, we all have our reasons why we would either give it or not. So we might all have different reasons. So it would really be upon each bodhisattva to look at themselves in terms of what am I holding on to that dollar for? And then you could look at a lot of other psychological machinations regarding, well, they're just going to use it for drugs. So I'm actually a better, I'm going to save this person, right? That's a great excuse. A tremendous excuse to not be generous is to think, no, I'm actually going to do them a favor by not giving it to them. Or we have ideas of like, I'm not going to support your you living on the streets or whatever it is, whatever it is. The idea, though, is, is that there's a lot of ideas going on in that holding on to that dollar. But then the Bodhisattva looks at dana, donation, giving, generosity and examines the, psycho the psychology of that. What's going on there with generosity, right? And what I'm getting at, the, 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 like what I'm really trying to get at here is that giving, while it seems like giving has to do with that person living on the street who's asking for the dollar and giving seems to be about them and whether I give it to them or not. But the Bodhisattva realizes that, that again, it's potentially, if not actually, detrimental to their own being to be, call it stingy or what have you. And the Bodhisattva realizes that it, it, is, it is to their great advantage to be generous. To, to their great advantage, uh, it, it's advantageous to the person who's asking for the dollar, and it's advantageous to the Bodhisattva who's giving the dollar. That sounds like a win-win. <laughs> Whereas in this other version, where I'm holding on to my dollar stingily, that person doesn't get to eat tonight or doesn't get a dollar that they are saying that they need. And I'm continuing this karmic process of holding on to my stuff in that way. That sounds like a lose-lose where the person that's asking for the dollar has lost out and I've lost out on the opportunity to practice giving. So the Bodhisattva is sort of looking at the whole giving situation from that perspective. And as I said a moment ago, it's from a place of wisdom that a Bodhisattva is generous in that way. All right, let's talk. Any uh, questions or ideas or comments about skillful giving, giving, knowing? Thank you, Michael. Can you yeah. hear me? All uh, right. Question. Yeah. That idea also of the giver. Again, we had talked about it previously. It's like, oh, I'm look, I'm giving you. I am giving you something. Thus, 
you know, look at I, I, oh, the merit. Yeah. That's the idea that was presented a long time ago to me was just leave it. Hmm. Let it be found. So if a child finds it, they're so excited. I remember finding five dollars and so excited. I was eight years old in 1960 something, and and five dollars bought a week worth of groceries. And then so, but maybe a child will find it. I don't know. Or maybe a drug addict will find it and get their next fix. Or maybe a rich man will find it and be oh, successful <laughs> and proud of themselves. But what was shown to me was it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just Donna. It's just graciousness. I can't always do it, but it doesn't matter because <laughs> I'm not doing it for, for a reason other than generosity. <clears throat> just a point. Excellent. Excellent, Noe. And your, your comment, by the way, loudly echoes what kind of my point here, which is that giving is a practice. And you said a moment ago that you, you might not do it every time. And that's where it becomes a practice in that way. Izzy, you got a your question, please. Oh, can't hear you. Uh, how about some something like, you know, like uh, work with an addict or an alcoholic where Sometimes it's recommended you stop working with that person or stop giving to that person because you've become part of the disease. Now, Izzy's question takes us to that next level. Izzy, your question takes us to the real idea of upaya, which is the skillful giving and the idea that there may become a moment in the bodhisattva's career, in the bodhisattva path, when the skillful giving is not giving. But that would be judiciously determined from one guiding principle, compassion. 100,000% out of compassion. And so if we really, so, you know, let's say, Izzy, just to, to, to piggyback off your, your comment. So let's say I had a friend who I knew had a very bad uh, uh, drug addiction, drug problem, dependency of some sort. And they came to me for a dollar. And I knew directly where that dollar was going to go. And out of compassion for them, it might be the most... Uh, kind, compassionate form of giving to not give them. Now, I don't know. Again, this is why I mentioned at the beginning that upaya is very in the moment. And that's why, I, Izzy, I'm so glad you asked your question the way you did, because it allows me this opportunity to say that the bodhisattva is always operating from compassion, kindness and compassion. And if they are, and, and again, only we can know our own hearts in that way, whether we actually are coming from a place of compassion and kindness. But if the Bodhisattva is coming from that place, their actions will always be skillful. That's the idea, is that if you're really leading from that place, then everything else that follows will be upayak in that sense. So... Hope that answers or kind of addresses your question. And again, you know, I'm not, um, I, I don't want to like try to dodge anything because the nature of upaya is that it's tricky that way, where it's not these uh, blanket statements that go for everything. It's a case by case basis in that way. So any other questions, comments, answers, ideas about giving, particularly having to do with sort of uh, social situations where we might be doing okay? Cool. So now let me address the other aspects of this bodhisattva path. So the sutra, it mentions that there's these two 
aspects to the Bodhisattva's practice of upaya. So when a Bodhisattva who practices upaya gives a handful of food to any single sentient being, even to an animal, they do so with an aspiration for all knowing wisdom, sarva jnana. So omniscience or all knowing wisdom. So when the Bodhisattva is doing this, this giving even to an animal, they do so with this aspiration for sarvanyana, omniscience. And they vow to share the merit of this giving with all sentient beings by transferring it to the universal attainment of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. So because of those two things, seeking sarvanyana and transference of the merit, they attract sentient beings into their following. So again, those two aspects, and I did, you know, I went over this last year in the Bodhisattva path series. These two aspects that the Bodhisattva is practicing this upaya, practicing, say, generosity and giving, sort of for two reasons, omniscience and with this vow to take any merit that has been gained and transferring it to all sentient beings' attainment of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, enlightenment. And that's, okay, so that sounds complicated, but let me walk you through it. So one way to think about it, and it's just one, let me go, I'll go back to my scenario. So the Bodhisattvas walking down the street and there's somebody looks like they're having a hard time and they ask for a dollar. I've got a dollar and now I'm faced with that decision. Do I hold on to this or do I give it away, right? The Bodhisattva of course is in this situation going to give the dollar away because they've been asked for it and they don't see any reason not to in that way. Now, in the giving of that dollar, they are doing that to, in order to attain this sarvanyana, omniscience. Now, I could tell you, and I will tell you very quickly, sarvanyana, like all knowledge or omniscience, we're, we're basically talking about uh, Buddha mind, Buddha knowledge. We're basically talking about being a Buddha. So the acquiring of sarvanyana, you could just gloss that as becoming a Buddha. And so the bodhisattva, in giving the, the dollar, they are doing so because they're on their way to becoming a Buddha. And they know they're not going to become a Buddha by holding on stingily to that dollar. Because last time I checked, I've never seen a Buddha stingily holding on to money. It, it just doesn't compute, right? So a bodhisattva who's interested in becoming a Buddha knows a Buddha is not going to be sitting there holding on to a dollar. And so from there, from the bodhisattva's aspiration for, for sarvanyana, they're going to give the dollar away. Now, the other way that I want to articulate that, so not just, not just because bodhisattvas are interested in becoming Buddhas, so they're generous. The way that I would put it tonight, upayakli for this class, is that the bodhisattva, and 
also, again, from last year, we would have kind of understood this. The Bodhisattva is really, how can I put this, actually? They're very kind of interested in, uh, what, uh, what word could I use? I, I want to be very uh, selective about this, too. Well, for right now, I'll just say that the Bodhisattva is sort of very interested in transcending the worldly. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, we call it, we call it the rat race, right? The kind of like the hustle and the bustle and the world of, you know, all of that. And the Bodhisattva is very much about transcending that. And when I say transcend it, I don't mean joining a monastery and giving up their, all their clothing, because that's the old Buddhist version of transcending. No, the Bodhisattva is more about, you know, transcending the anxiety of it all, transcending this worrying about it all. And so what I mean is, is that from the perspective of the Bodhisattva, a dollar, it's a, it's a piece of paper, like from that Bodhisattva point of view, or at least from the, from the place that the Bodhisattva is trying to get to, a dollar is just a piece of paper and, or uh, what, cotton, sorry. But the point is it's, from that perspective, it's just a rectangular <laughs> sheet of cotton. And this person, for some reason, wants a rectangular sheet of cotton. So, fine, <laughs> like, the Bodhisattva is, again, Oper or working on transcending all of that. And again, I don't mean not using money. I just mean not being so concerned about it in that way. Not so anxious about it in that way. And so once again, going back to my original example, the Bodhisattva's got that dollar and they've been asked for it, but they might not give it. And the Bodhisattva looks at that holding on to it. And it's just like, oh, well, that's a great way to just stay stuck in the mire of the world is just greedily holding on to my dollar. And it's, again, not even necessarily out of a great magnanimous sense of generosity that the Bodhisattva gives the dollar. It's more like, Oh, you, you need a rectangular sheet of cotton? Oh, okay, here. Because <laughs> I don't need the rectangular sheet of cotton in that sense. So when I say, or what I'm getting at is, is that this aspiration for all knowledge, it's basically a, a bodhisattva has much higher aspirations than a dollar. A bodhisattva has higher aspirations than a billion dollars, a trillion dollars, frankly, because all of it would only keep you in samsara from the perspective of the bodhisattva. Whereas generosity and giving, that's your ticket out of samsara. So, Noam, did you have a question or anybody have questions, comments, answers, ideas about Sarvanyana or giving? Hello, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. It's a, as you know, a Bodhisattva, everything that's coming, everything that's arriving is, is the world. It's this is it. I'm not, the, the, you know, the homeless person on the street is me. It's it's my experience. It's it's my being. It's like, and so therefore, I I have a choice of how I interact with it. It's not. I'm not separate. I believe I'm not separate from the homeless person or the hungry person or the little bird 
or the butterflies or these guys here. <laughs> hey, hey, uh, you know, because I have come, the Bodhisattva has compassion to be, to give it all away, to not hold on to it. Mm -hmm. So when I see a homeless person, I was guided to the idea that that is me. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at them through, looking through their eyes in my imagination. I'm looking up at myself from the street and seeing myself. It, it just makes it an easier way to, for me to, to have compassion in the world. Or, or a, a Bodhisattva would have compassion that way. I don't. I <laughs> I still struggle. <laughs> so, but it is that thing. It's that thing of it, this is this is it. This is there's nothing else, if I may. There's nothing else other than the delusion. And when I start pulling into the delusion, then I'm deluded. Mm -hmm. So being mindful and skillful is to be here now. <clears throat> Sorry. No, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. And then I have to yeah, yeah, yeah. Noe, I just, no, I just to to your comment, I just wanted to remind everybody there is a a deeper, deeper teaching in the Bodhisattva path, and Noe, your comment sort of is related to it. The deeper teaching is about actually seeing that person who has asked for the dollar, that they are actually a superior bodhisattva who has come to test my resolve to give. And so they are the great teacher who has presented me with the opportunity to practice. And so not only is it a great practice, but I've gotten to meet a superior bodhisattva <laughs> along the way. So, yeah, Brendan, what you got? In, just along those lines, yeah, like, uh, you know, somebody asks you for something and then you're this opportunity to kind of check in with, you know, your clinging or your um, compassion or whatever might be going on for you. Um, so yeah, but I mean, that's basically, yeah, you, you just said that, I think, uh, better. So, yeah. Um, and I like the, uh, Noe's, you know, like this could be me or this is me. I mean, it's sort of, this is your sort of reality, uh, in which somebody is in need or is, you know, yeah. So anyway, thanks. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And also along the lines of what, uh, uh, Noe was saying, also, of course, and I mean, this is a little deeper, so I won't go too into it tonight, but what Noe was uh, speaking about is very much related to sort of the idea of dependent origination, which is a foundation of the Bodhisattva's wisdom, and what the Bodhisattva understands as far as codependent arising is that indeed, Noe, self and other arise simultaneously together according to the teachings of dependent origination. And therefore, Noe, your comment about I am that person asking for the dollar, I'm asking myself for a dollar in that way, that's a very wise, dependent origination way of thinking about it. And once again, and now this kind of relates to what Brendan said, in terms of checking in with, with your practice in that sense. So now, once again, I've been asked for this dollar, and I have this choice to hold on to it or to give it away. And to be generous and give it away closes the gap, the, the illusion, the uh, delusional gap that is between me and this person. Whereas holding on to it, I'm not going to give it to them. That helps preserve 
that delusional me, it, us, them, subject, object, delusional relationship. So excellent. Which brings me to, unless there's any other questions, comments, answers, ideas. Which brings me to the second part of the Bodhisattva's practice of upaya. So the first part was about going for Buddhahood rather than just mundane reality, the sarvanyana, omniscience. And then the other aspect was about, and then vowing to share the merit of this giving with all sentient beings by transferring it to the universal attainment of enlightenment. So that's the other aspect of the Bodhisattva's, uh, the Bodhisattva path. The Bodhisattva path is not just interested in their own enlightenment. They are very, very invested in all sentient beings attaining awakening, enlightenment. And so there is this practice that we talked about last year. The practice is called Parinirmana, normally tra uh, translated as transference of merit. And that is what the, the text reference as far as, so I'm walking down the street, I get asked for the dollar, I'm going for Buddhahood, I'm on the Bodhisattva path, so I give, uh, you know, very quickly give the dollar away. Well, now there's an idea that I've done something good. Kushala. And because I've done something good, I've gotten merit. So the next part of the Bodhisattva's practice is to transfer the big giveaway, to transfer all of that merit to all sentient beings attaining awakening. And this is sort of along the lines of Oh, and I don't want to forget that Renata had a question. So Renata, I'm coming back in one second. But this is part of the Bodhisattva's form of, what would you call it? I, you know, you kind of, you know, oh, uh, words like altruism come to mind and things like that. But what I mean is, is that the Bodhisattva's deepest sort of vow in that way is for all sentient beings to wake up, for all sentient beings to attain enlightenment. And in many ways, going back to the remarks I was saying earlier about things, actions that support the delusional sense of self, because the Bodhisattva is interested in not supporting delusional senses of self, their practice is entirely about universal benefit all the time. And in many ways, what the Bodhisattva realizes is the moment they're only interested in their own enlightenment, the moment they have a sense of, you know, we're all in this alone, we're all born alone and die alone. So good luck, everybody. I'll be over here practicing. The Bodhisattva knows that that is just a cul-de-sac. It is just a place where you'll be on your little Bodhisattva tricycle all day spinning in a circle and never becoming awake <laughs> because of that attitude of, no, 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 I'm just going to get awakened. Good luck. And so once again, it's, it's out of wisdom that a bodhisattva then is interested in this transference of their merit to the awakening of all sentient beings. Uh, Renata, then Noe, unless Renata, you, you, your question was resolved. <laughs> well, I guess, I mean, there are people out there that really do want to rip you off. I mean, just in re real life. And you do need to protect yourself from those people. And I guess I'm wondering, I guess that's not very bodhisattva of one to want to be self-protective because 
um, you know, you've been through something in the past and you, you don't really want to go through that again. So does that mean you, you, you just don't, <laughs> you're never going to be a Bodhisattva if you don't want to be ripped off? Okay, Renata, your question is super appropriate, 100,000%. You are, I feel like you, even in saying your question though, I feel like you kind of caught yourself a little bit. And what I mean is this idea of getting ripped off, ripped off of uh, rectangles of cotton, ripped off of what exactly? Now, I am not advocating anybody put themselves in any position of danger or anything like that. It's nothing like that. In fact, I would refer back to Brendan's remark about checking in with one's practice. And so what I mean is, is that this, this idea of getting ripped off, ripped off of, from, of what in that way? What, what am I holding on to that I'm gonna get? Again, from the Bodhisattva's point of view, Holding on to possessions and like even money and stuff is problematic. And so if somebody else wants to cling and hold on to a bunch of, uh, you know, meaning they want to steal my stuff or they want to take my money, from the Bodhisattva's point of view, that person is just getting themselves into trouble by wanting to take my stuff. Now, again, Renata, I... I want to be very careful in these Dharma talks about upaya to make it really clear that I'm not, I'm not suggesting that a bodhisattva becomes, uh, what would they say, uh, a doormat, right? And just stepped all over and that that's like a bodhisattva practice. Not at all. I am not saying that the bodhisattva just gets stepped all over and by such humility, they get enlightened. We're not talking about that. Again, I go back to Brendan's comment about checking in with ourselves. And so this idea of getting ripped off, it would just be about the Bodhisattva examining what it is they're holding on to, what it is they're feeling is at risk in that way, and really looking at what, this idea of get, kind of getting ripped off in that sense. So Renata, again, I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm dodging questions it's just these things are tricky in that way all right and noe uh as time yeah just just really quick uh just you know that idea of of um and i can't even claim that i th that generosity isn't even mine to claim if i think about it i, I don't want it I, 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 the mer the 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 meta is not mine. It never was mine, <laughs> but I generated it. But really, it's just give it away, and there's no recognition for it. Mm, that's all. Yep. And sure. and and Noe, just to clarify, it's also sort of about, and, and I'm kind of again just echoing what Noe just said. We, I know that we, uh, meaning, you know, English speaking Americans, we might not entirely think in terms of merit, especially punya, which is a more, you know, Indian idea of that you can actually like accrue merit, you like build it up in that way. And I know that, you know, we Americans don't entirely think of it that way. So in order to translate this to modern English speaking America, you can think of like the merit as the feeling that I've done something good and am therefore a good person. And this is where it gets really, really tricky because it's not that it's not good. It is good. That's the whole point. To be stingy and hoardy and mean and angry is, is not good. And so to be generous is good. But what the Bodhisattva is kind of like on the lookout for is further psychological turnings, like I'm such a good person, 
that might cycle back into delusional senses of self. And so rather than even risking that, the Bodhisattva immediately turns it all over. And there's a sense in which, yeah, again, it's, it's, again, it gets very tricky because we don't want to say, well, actually, let me put it to you this way. I'll put it, this is a much better way, much more upayic way to put it. So the Bodhisattva gets asked for a dollar. They've got a dollar, so they give it away. But then they, of course, have done something good or they have accrued some merit from the giving of this dollar. And so they transfer the merit of that to all sentient beings. But that's another no. good action that you will then receive merit for. Well, you're gonna have to then transfer that merit as well. And it becomes an ever cascading practice of transference. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and on that yeah. on that note of an ever cascading flow of transference, uh, questions, comments, answers, ideas. Sure. Uh, my name is Gabriel. I have a question. I'm new, so um, feel free. Lean into the camera. Oh, can you see? now you can see me. Okay. Hello. Um, it sounded like, and I think what a couple of people are asking is that the central or almost kind of like uh, main. I guess, like guideline or rule, if you want to call it that, um, is um, compassion to decide, you know, what is kind of the right action, or that's the main thing. Um, and I guess I'm a bit confused as to how to like, I guess, use the word operationalize compassion. So to be concrete, because sometimes it's harder to understand in a more abstract way, you know, uh, I've had friends, um, where uh, there are situations where uh, they've asked for help, um, when, when they have had, for example, like suicidal ideation, and I've helped, but in certain ways, right, like, one can only help so much meaning with their time. And, you know, I'm just a regular person, I don't have necessarily the expertise, or let's say in relationships, right, the question becomes, especially intimate relationships with boundaries, kind of like when to give. So I'm wondering, kind of like, yeah, I guess, how does one think about compassion? Um, uh, because one thing it seems like is not the answer is um right like in a utilitarian calculus is kind of like well what is the benefit that that is not so the question kind of like how does one you know is it about a feeling or you know like how does one and i know it's obviously case by case and there's no but just kind of you know what would be the i don't want to say checklist but what would be the process of kind of like going through that and forgive me if this is not where the discussion is going to go but that just was my question Awesome question, Gabriel. Right, right on point. Um, I'll use this opportunity to say something that I should have said before. So, uh, Gabriel, I'm glad that you um, mentioned what I had said about that the that the driving force of the Bodhisattva's practice is compassion, 100%. I do, and I should have said this earlier we need to throw into that compassion for the self. You, you, we, we're a sentient being too. And so compassion for the self is also right there with it. And this actually, I guess, goes back to Renata's question as well, which is about if whatever you're going to do isn't going to be compassionate towards yourself, then it's not compassionate. Like that's kind of the idea. And so maybe that uh, resolves that problem of getting ripped off or getting stepped on or walked over because that would be not compassionate towards the self. And so the Bodhisattva is interested in that. Now to go to Gabriel's question a little more directly, the, there's more to this story, of course, which is that there are these guiding principles such as Ahimsa, for example, number one, nonviolence. That's like in terms of practice, in terms of activity, karma, nonviolence, top of the list. And so the idea is, is that the Bodhisattva has these guiding principles like nonviolence, truth, being a truth speaker, so not speaking falsely, 
things like that. And the idea is, is that if we are always coming from a place of compassion and are in line with these principles like nonviolence, particularly, I, again, our, our actions will be more skillful, if not upayak, meaning like expediently skillful in that sense. And so, uh, you know, the, um, the idea is, I, I could say this as well. So if a friend comes to us and they're not asking for money, but they're asking for some sort of assistance or help in some other way, like you mentioned, maybe they're having certain thoughts. This teaching of generosity, it is about so much more than the giving of material things. One of the greatest offerings or givings that we can give is our attention. And so the idea is, is that just being present for somebody can be a tremendous act of giving. So a friend, like you're mentioning, just being present, being attentive, being uh, listening in that sense. And if one is then guided by compassion, kindness, and nonviolence and truth and all of those things, meaning the precepts or the basics of Buddhist discipline, actions will be skillful. That's sort of part of the idea that we're talking about here tonight. So, all right, Gabriel, again, that was a great question. I'm sorry it was so late. I would have liked to give that a much longer, better answer, but that's gonna have to suffice for tonight because it's 8.30, so. All right, everybody. That's it for me. Michael, thank you so much. It's, it's great everyone. to everyone. That was wonderful. And uh, it's great to have you back. And uh, it was all very skillful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, do you have any announcements before I? I do. I uh, so yeah, for everybody new, uh, I have my own kind of a Buddhist uh, little school of Buddhism where I teach classes. It's called Lotus Underground. And I'm getting ready to offer, oh, thanks, Noam. Uh, I'm getting ready to offer three new classes starting this month, uh, a sutra study class, a beginner course on dependent origination, and an intermediate mm -hmm. study course on the Buddhist idea of tathata or suchness. Um, you can go to lotusunderground.com and on the homepage is all the, the dates, the times, all of that good stuff. And you can also register there. Uh, so yeah, so those are all coming up later this month. And so please go over to Lotus Underground and check that out and register if you're interested in any of those. Um, otherwise, I'll be back next Sunday with another installment of Upaya.